I want to bring in Justin Renfro. He is a professional football player who has spent time in the NFL and the CFL. We reach him at his off-season home in Philadelphia, a city hit hard by unrest after the death of uh, Justin Floyd and of, of George Floyd, rather. And Justin, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to speak with us. What's this past week been like for you? Uh, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, this past week is definitely. Uh, it's been eye-opening, to uh, say the least, uh, especially coming home from Canada, like you mentioned earlier. I've been playing up there for the past three years, and uh, you don't really see, I don't, you don't hear about police brutality like that, and I, I don't walk around Canada with the same fear. Uh, in the past week, you know, things have changed, even within my household, uh, I'm not even, under my parents' orders as a professional athlete, I'm not even allowed to be at the local park at all or when it's, especially any time that it's dark. And my parents have even been coming to work out with me to supervise me, things like that. So it's definitely been eye-opening uh, to just continue to see African-American lives being devalued. Uh, it hurts. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping and praying for some type of change and, uh I think the peaceful protest part is making some difference, but there's more to be done. So just let me understand. So your parents go with you to the park or they, they follow you in the car just to make sure that you're okay in case you have some kind of bad interaction. Is that what you're, that what you're trying to say? Uh, that's exactly what I'm saying, yes. That's uh, what goes on even now. Uh, it used to be that I've had incidences uh, when I was younger uh, fourth grade police following me when I'm trying to run and get ready for s summer training camp as a fourth grader and things like that. And so parents are always just trying to protect me and make sure pr I can make it through. I was only supposed to be home for a week. And part of the reason I only come home for the short time is because the last time I was home three years ago, I had an incident with police pulling me over Pull, uh, pulling guns, saying I stole the car that I own, and saying that I didn't have insurance on it. And enough was enough. That was a close enough call for myself. That was a close enough call for my parents. And I've been living in Canada, and they've been making sure to come visit me up there. So, yeah, so wait a uh, second. You t can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I don't know. I don't know that people really understand that this is the kind of thing that can just happen if you're a black man in the United States that so you're driving a oh. car and then and then what happens uh, so I, I have uh, a BMW that has black tint a lot that will cause suspension cause suspicion in a lot of neighborhoods I live in a suburban neighborhood of Philadelphia predominantly white I got I got tailed across the whole town pulled over right on the edge of that borough, pulled over in a big parking lot. Uh, I actually called a, right away, I called a friend to come meet me in that parking lot, kind of as backup. By the time my friend got there, three police are surrounding me. Car, They're trying to open car doors before they even come speak to me. And this, supposedly this was, this was all because my car looked like a recently uh, stolen car and I supposedly didn't have insurance. Funny fact is, I knew I specifically had insurance because it was coming out of my Canadian account because that was after my first year in the CFL. So US dollars were being taken out of the Canadian account. So I was noticing the hit every month when that was coming out. So to be able to kind of go through that, I've just removed myself from the situation. And now to get stuck here during COVID, and it's kind of like everything I've been running away from is now being thrown in my face and you can't run away from it anymore. So imagine, you know, you're a grown man that need that feels the needs of your, and I understand this, but I just think it's an incredible thing. You're training, you're obviously not playing in the CFL right now because of uh, the pandemic and the circumstances. So you feel the need to have your parents around just kind of watching over you, almost like your, your security guards, right? Uh, yeah, and that it's kind of a safety thing for them. My parents rather be there to just let me be five minutes from the house. It's literally five minutes from the house. Where, and the crazy part is it's where I attended middle school. 
I went there for three years. My picture's in there for winning one of the first middle school football championships there. And you still have to be worried and and my like my mom calls me. She before all this went down and it was decided I needed to be home. My mom would call me like, "It's dark. You need to be home. Where are you?" And so, you know, that's uh, real life down here, and that's what we go through. And you uh, told one of our producers that you, as an adult, as a as as an adult, you have never had a good interaction or a positive experience interacting with a police officer in the United States. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah. In the United States, that would be correct. Yeah. And what about in Canada? Uh, in Canada, I've had a lot. And that's why even through all of this, I've been trying to kind of keep a positive and message and kind of ask other police officers for help to police, police themselves. Because in Canada, I have a had a great experience. Uh, I work with the Boys and Girls Club, Big Brother, Big Sisters, and coach youth football while I'm in Canada. And throughout all those interactions, I've met with officers, uh, Officer Greg Amy in uh, Calgary. I was just texting with him before I'm on air with you. And earlier this morning, Jeremy Pierce in Vancouver talking with them. And uh, the thing I'm just trying to get people to understand uh, is, you know, there are good officers, just like on the football field, when you mess up, a coach says something, it means something. But when one of your players, when one of the, your friends, a player who you've been to training camp with, when one of them tells you, like, man, you messed this up there, it, it sticks with you. So I feel like the same way police officers in the U.S., uh, they go through uh, they go through a training academy for eight for eight months, so they spend that eight months together. So somebody you spent eight months of eight months with comes and tells you, "Hey, man, that you know that's wrong. That's not what we learned in the academy." That will go a long way, and so that's kind of the message I'm trying to get out and trying to pe preach. Because I'm hoping and praying for the future. I have a son. Mm -hmm. I don't want my son to be scared to drive through his neighborhood, and so that I live with that fear. That's going to be there. I, how old is how old is your son? Our son's ten. So he's, so he's you, right. Are you having these kind of conver so are you having these kind of conversations? Uh, I to be honest, I haven't. I've been trying to mm -hmm. shield kind of from this because I, mm -hmm. I thought it was a lot at first, and, and like I said earlier, I felt like I kind of was running from. So those are some things I had to face to keep the real life issues. You know, as things start to get more serious in the week, you know, I might have to say something to my son because, you know, he's getting of age with the travel baseball. I mean, he, do he doesn't understand it yet, but every time when I go go to watch him play baseball in Florida, I mean, I, I tuck my hat a little bit because he plays right across the street on a baseball field from a Confederate flag. He doesn't understand that, but I understand. And that's the little league football I mean, Little League Baseball field he plays for. So it's a tough thing to deal with, tough thing to wrestle with as a father, as a man. Uh, you know, you just try to keep moving forward every day and be the best person for your child and to try to get other people to be the best person to give your child a good world. What do you... I'm, I want to ask you a bunch of things just in terms of the protests, but also let's go back to eight days ago. Uh, when we saw that video emerge of uh, that police officer with his knee on the neck of George Floyd. What did you think as you saw that? And then, of course, we learned that he died shortly after that. Uh, well, the fir my first, as soon as I saw the video, my first thing was, why did nobody help? Like, you saw that man die. He, he was dying and the cries for help, like, the cries for help shook me, even right now sitting here. It's still, like, I can't breathe, and, like, you keep seeing the signs, and so for me, that's another reason why I don't want my son to see the things, because for me, every time I see one of those can't breathe signs, I still can hear that in, in my, like, my earphones are still in from when I first heard the video. And so for me, that's tough, and then, to be honest, the sec that was the first it was tough, but then the next day, 
the football player in me that was in the NFL, first thing that came to me was, where are all the people that were yelling and calling African-American football players monkeys and y'all monkeys need to stop kneeling and all that stuff about the NFL and what Colin Kaepernick did. But look, now we're, what, three years later? We still have the same issue, and I would say times two, because we have two young men dying in this, in this just this last three months that I've been home, because I got stuck home during the COVID. So just in this last bit, I've been stuck home. We have two young men dying. Did you think and, when you when you saw that? Did you think back to that time where you know guns were pulled when you were driving the BMW and think that that could have been me? I actually said I said that to somebody yesterday. I was like, I was just, I just had another, I had a friend there, and I had my phone on, uh, and I had my phone recording. I, I had, I have two, I have an American cell phone and a U.S. cell phone, and I had my Canadian cell phone on recording. And honestly, between that and the Geico driver, I think that's, I mean, the Geico call center person. That's the only reason I'm here, and I, I admitted that to somebody yesterday. You think and, you would? Uh, you think you would have been killed in that in that moment if if it hadn't been for that? Uh, you know, if uh, you know, if you don't have other people kind of watching, and me, I guess having proper training from the home, like announcing, like, "Hey, I'm pulling out my phone to call Geico. Are you okay with me pulling out my phone to call Geico?" And like you're saying, the conversation, like my dad having that conversation with me in sixth grade after a kid on another team called me, called me the N. And having that home training, I think those combination things kept me from dying. But no, if I would have just heard them say, I don't have insurance and grab my phone, I probably would be gone. And that that's real life here. So many people get killed not having a. Uh, unarmed reaching for phones and i think if i didn't say three four times and get them to acknowledge they heard me that i'm just getting the phone out yeah i would be gone probably wow when you see the protests that are taking place across the united states um, many of them peaceful some of them get a little out of hand later at night what what do you make of them all uh to what was it sunday night I, uh, that was the first night I started tuning into things. I, uh, I was in the city of Philadelphia picking up some things, uh, and I saw the city getting shut down and I didn't quite know cause I was driving and out while it was going on. So when I got home that night, I did watch and what stuck out to me was, uh, Como on the prime time on CNN, he kept pointing out city to city. You have your the African American people are over on this side doing the peaceful protest, and then he was stopping frames and telling cameramen to stop. Like, notice who's throwing the fire. Notice who's flipping over the trash can. Like, I remember that was a specific example. There was a there was a uh, people threw uh, something into a trash can, and he pointed out and said, "Know who's know who's right there throwing that." And so. I uh, feel like the news has done a good job showing what's going on, uh, but I also think you, people are right. I don't. I don't think the the looting is necessarily right, but the protesting uh, is definitely right. And I think at at an end, the looting has to happen because nobody's voice is being heard. I mean, how many years is it later? People are still dying. People like. All you can do is try to get people's attention and uh, and continue to hope and pray at this point as well. Justin, appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's pro football player Justin Renfro joining us from Philadelphia.